Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor at the Mises Institute. And with me again is Tho Bishop, my associate editor. And we're back again to talk about democracy like last time. This time we're going to cover uh, a little bit different uh, area. We're going to talk uh, uh, about Hoppe and Rothbard and Hayek and some other ideas about democracy and how it can be used or made to work a little bit better. And we'll just be a little bit more on the theoretical level this time than last time. So, Tho, how you doing? Doing well. This is going to be a fun conversation. Well, I hope so. Uh, when we looked at the comments from our last video, uh, there seemed to be uh, a, a lot of responses that uh, took a more simple view than what we were saying. Basically, well, democracy is the worst thing ever. The only way you can improve is get rid of it entirely. And uh, no, with, with no helpful comments, uh, explanation of how that might be done. So, <laughs> although that's often the case, often when we talk about democracy, we seem to get uh, two responses from our core readers. We get one from the more conservative side of people, and that's the whole "we're a republic, not a democracy" argument. Now, I've I've written a whole column about that on how that's basically a uh, unhelpful and useless slogan that communicates almost no information. I guess all it does is signal. I don't like majoritarian politics. Okay, that's fine. But almost no content is ever uh, uh, accompanying that slogan. But that's not what we were encountering this time, mostly. It was the other side of things, which is the more diehard, libertarian, hoppian side of things, which is uh, democracy, that is, voting of any kind is terrible, and we need some sort of authoritarian system where nobody's allowed to vote. Obviously, not exactly the... Uh, imagined system from 18th century America. So, well, what? <laughs> so is that is that good? Should should we be doing that though? As members of the Mises Institute, you know, we we encounter a lot of diversity. I think actually um, that uh, in terms of you know political theories, in terms uh, and a lot of this is shaped by different countries, different his histories, and all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's very interesting. Um, but like I, one of the questions that I think comes across when you have people that understand the value of the marketplace and they understand the importance of voluntary political arrangements and this sort of stuff is, is kind of the question is, OK, well, why should we care about politics at all? You know, you know what is the value of, of kind of looking at the nuance when we know that you know, the state is a group of, of thieves writ large and all that sort of stuff? And it's, it's, it's a very fair question. And I think that there's a lot of there's a, there's a fine argument to be made that ignoring politics entirely might be very good for your psychological well-being. And I, I certainly do not fault anybody that kind of has that retreatist mindset of, OK, I'm just going to have a have a family and a farm and not care about the outside world. And, yeah, this this is my my little slice of liberty. And that, I think that's great. Um, but I do think that there is value for uh, you know understanding the mechanisms that govern the world as it exists right now, you know, how do we make uh, political orders better rather than the ideal and one, one big uh, step? Um, and obviously, you know, Rothbard himself you know, did a lot of work in trying to understand how, you know, these, this idea of strategies for liberty. How do you take these ideas and put them in the real world? Um, you know, even, you know, Dr. Hoppe, um, with, you know, he, he's given a number of talks over the years of kind of, you know, how do we make this a practical approach to the, the you know, world of private governance that uh, I, I think most of uh, kind of people in our orbit desire? Um, because, again, just ignoring these questions don't make them go away. Uh, you know, politics itself is kind of fundamentally about persuasion. And so, you know, understanding and looking at, you know, some of the real trade-offs that you get you know, that's what economics is all about, right? Understanding trade-offs. Um, so that, you know, if, you know, what, what does it look like to, you know, to make a democratic society, you know, more free? What does it look like? You know, what are, what are the advantages that you have there relative to other systems like monarchies and everything else? What are the disadvantages? Um, and, and, you know, do you know, groups of people always follow the same uh, incentive structures. I mean, I think even that there's, there's a lot of differences throughout history and there's a lot of differences and in, in outcomes there that are, are worth kind of diving into if you are interested in you know, kind of political science at all as, as a subject. So hopefully uh, I, with, with sort of these conversations, which is a kind of, I think a little bit different, con uh, a different type of content than a lot of the stuff that we provide, 
Um, we're kind of you know, digging into some issues that I think are, are important, but you know, may not be for everyone. And that's OK, too. Well, for starters, you should probably summarize for us, though, just the real quick, the basics of Hoppe's critique. I, I My impression is that when people uh, act like they're big Hoppians and they hate democracy for that reason, when I read deeper, it usually seems that the person who made the comment hasn't actually read the book, uh, <laughs> Democracy, the God That Failed, although I'm sure sometimes they have. But there, there seems to usually just be a very vulgar... Uh, simplistic idea behind what he's saying there. And maybe you can give us just a, a little bit better idea of what the nuance is there. There's this this kind of edgelord factor to Hoppo, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I, with, within the internet culture, right, the, the way that ideas translate, um, again, I think the history of, of memes and its influence on global politics is actually a really, really fascinating subject. Um, you know, particularly, you know, when we understand the, the, the way that ideas shape society. I have an article on this. Um, you know, the fact that some people see very superficial details of what Hoppe has written about. Um, obviously, the best example, obviously, is uh, you know, Triple H Physical Removal Service, where you know, all these memes about you know, Hoppe, or, yeah, Hoppe throwing uh, communists out of helicopters in this Pinochet uh, sort of fashion, which I always thought was kind of ironic because like Hayek, who you know, a lot of ho online Hoppians kind of make fun of, like, you know, Hayek had some nicer things to say about Pinochet uh, than Hop Hoppe has. Um, so, you know, the, these aren't kind of great, you know, in-depth analysis of Hoppe's work. They're, they're just kind of uh, uh, little caricatures that translate, uh, you know, that, that are kind of make, make for good online humor. Um, you know, anything that drives people to, to look at uh, the underlying ideas is a good thing. Um, but, I mean, you know, Really, the, you know, Hoppe's critique on democracy has a lot to do with the incentive structures in place. You know, if you're dealing with a monarch that has a longer uh, time preference that that has to, you know, is not concerned about winning his election every four years, um, you know, they have a structure there that incentivizes thinking, all, you know, in the long term, um, you know, what is the best for you know, preserving a, a longer society. Whereas kind of democracy kind of creates this race to the bottom of, of you're trying to vo bribe voters in election processes. You're trying to, to get as many people into your camp as possible. Um, and, you know, that the dynamic there incentivizes bad policy, um, whereas, you know, more permanent political structures pr uh, promote you know, being good stewards of political arrangements. And you know, the role of time preference is obviously, I think, a you know, very important role in you know, economic calculations. And, and you know, you know I, th I think a lot of it does, you know, there's, there's the, in, the in, uh, heightening our time preference, I think, has definitely created all sorts of problems with, uh, with society as it exists today. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily true that in all democratic systems, uh, you have this race of who's going to bribe the most voters in, in a very narrow sense of self-interest. Um, and in fact, within kind of American uh, political science literature, you've seen all of this. You, you've seen a lot of people kind of confused on why, you know, why is it that people in Kansas vote for a Republican Party that, um, you know, was character, you know, characterized as being the party of the Chamber of Commerce and the yacht clubs rather than you know, blue collar union hall workers. And it's because like there's, there's more there that goes in, you know, the democratic process and, and individual decision making um, than, you know, oh, who's going to give me the biggest check? And uh, so I, I think that when we look at how you navigate uh, you know, dealing with these sort of societies, um, you're trying to better understand that and, and trying to figure out the mechanisms that can perhaps lead to better outcomes um, is something that has some value. So if we had to reduce Hoppe to, the, to one sentence, we might say, all else being equal, once the voters figure out that they can just vote themselves free money, then, then they'll do so. The question is, is all else equal? And clearly, uh, Mises, Ludwig von Mises, considered this issue, as we discussed last time in uh, Bureaucracy and in other works. He's talked about the issue of once... You have a mass of the voters, a majority who concludes it's easier to just vote themselves free pensions and so on. Then you have a serious problem as a democratic state of some kind. The question is, 
When does that occur? Does it always occur? How fast does it occur? Is there any way to prevent that? Mises's view was that if people uh, subscribe to a liberal ideology, that is classical liberal, then it won't happen immediately and may actually give you a very well-functioning state for quite a long time, uh, provided that people have the proper view of the functions of the state. So are things always equal? It appears not. Just as you said, there are other factors, there are other issues that go into how people vote other than can I just vote myself a free check? Now, certainly some people do that. So we have to look then at the actual historical context then, I think. And it's always real important to say what we mean by democracy, because obviously democracy in some multi-ethnic African state where they just have some big mass election and there's no federalism, that's one thing. In Switzerland, it's something else entirely. And so if we just blithely refer to all those things as democracy, it doesn't really tell us very much at all about what sort of uh, regime we're talking about. So in the American context, then, we've got two periods, I think, that we would uh, describe as the most democratic periods in, in terms of expanding the vote, in terms of relying on a voting mass uh, to deliver what it is the ascendant political uh, group wants, or at least one of the major groups want. And uh, the first of those is Jacksonian uh, the Jacksonian period. And the second one is uh, the old so-called Bourbon Democrats, or uh, just really the Democrats. The Bourbons was actually a slur uh, created by their enemies. And so we've got two periods of that where there was a uh, concerted effort to expand the vote. And this was believed to actually expand liberty and to cut off the power of minority groups, rich people, powerful people who controlled, say, the central bank and other institutions. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the first of those periods, the Jacksonians. It's interesting because the, the Jacksonian era is often kind of, kind of sold as kind of a continuation of, of some of like this, the Jeffersonian idealism. When in reality, kind of the, the Virginian decision makers that, that had controlled uh, politics in America, you know, since Jefferson's election, looked very down upon uh, Jackson. You know, their, their candidate at that time was uh, uh, getting William Crawford, uh, who ended up having a, a debilitating, debilitating stroke, um, which, uh, you know, they, he, he still beat uh, uh, Henry Clay in, in an election that year, but uh, he, you know, it, Martin Van Buren actually was, was initially an ally of, of Crawford, and, and so they were trying to kind of prop him up without letting people know of how, how bad his, his health was after that stroke. Um, but you know, Jackson was seen as kind of a weapon against the elite by a group of voters that now had political power they did not have before, the expansion of the franchise. Um, and I, you know, that was a, a, an original sort of uh, American populist movement against what had been a pre-existing political dynasty there with, with the Virginian control of things. And he represented uh, you know, a, a Western territory that was you did not have the, the longest last, you know, the same sort of uh, longevity uh, of within the American Union of, of kind of some of these great political families of New England and, and other elsewhere. And so, again, it, that was a kind of a, a very democratic skepticism of established power, um, as, you know, Rothbard, you know, wrote about it, uh, in this a, a topic that uh, Patrick Newman covered during the Supporter Summit. Uh, this year in, in Jekyll Island, um, you know, Jackson's war against the bank and financial interest war, you know, was a major defining point of, of his presidency. Um, and, you know, a lot of that goes to a democratic check against uh, perceived privilege of, you know, when you have a, a small elite benefiting at the expense of the rest. Um, here's a way where that liberty versus power dynamic that, you know, Rothbard had looked the, the lens of history at actually a, a democratic system um, was used as a check against a minority of powerful people. Um, and again, you know, we, we don't want to go overboard in, in praising you know, Jackson's presidency. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of aspects there that you know, he, he wasn't exactly the, the great states' white rights this, uh, champion that he is sometimes uh, described as. There's all sorts of interesting things and nuances there typically is in history. Um, but again, here's an example of dem democracy being used as a check against the powers of the elite. Um, and it's, it's a very inter interesting episode in, in early American history. And of course, universal manhood suffrage, uh, at least for white people, <laughs> comes in in that period. And 
it was very expansive, like they weren't kidding. So this was a departure from earlier notions where you had to be property owning and you had to be well established within your community. And there were many more limitations prior to this. You might even maybe in much earlier times had to have been members of an established church and things like that. And those ideas go back to 17th century England. But they moved away from that in the 19th century. So now basically any man who wasn't black for the most part, because this would include even uh, out in Western territories by mid-century, would, would include uh, many uh, people who were of Mexican descent. Uh, in some places, it would include um, Asians, even some Indians who were no longer affiliated with a tribe and so on. And... So it was, uh, in the big scheme of things, historically, extremely democratic, more democratic than England, which was the most democratic country in Europe at the time, because at the time in the 1830s and then again in the 1860s, the British were expanding their franchise uh, to the middle classes and then even down into the working classes. And this was seen as a very democratic move, uh, much more so than was going on certainly in Central Europe and certainly more so than in Spain and other countries. And But that was nothing compared to what was going on in the United States in terms of expanding the vote. So that was a big component of what the Jacksonians were trying to do. And then it, that continued after the Civil War again with uh, the Democrats of that period. And the Democrats, I should be clear, were the good party in the late 19th century. This was the party that was in favor of local control. They were uh, They tended to be against... Uh, tariffs. The Republicans were for big punitive tariffs and so on. Uh, and uh, they were for, at least in, in the case of the Cleveland Democrats, in favor of hard money. And it was only later that she had William Jennings Bryan with this whole cross of gold speech and all of that uh, ruined all of that. But for a period there, the Democrats were far and away the best uh, party. But they were also very much in favor of expanding the franchise to many immigrants. It was uh, Cleveland who vetoed a bill to require uh, for immigrants literacy tests before they could vote. And on the, on the same issue, they were uh, allowing states to unilaterally expand who could vote on their own. And I cover this in an article on uh, how immigrants were allowed to vote in these territories in the West. And this wasn't just west of the Mississippi. This included some new territories, like uh, even in the Midwest, say, Wisconsin and uh, Iowa, which I suppose is west of the Mississippi, uh, but not that far west. And, and you had that, and certainly in Colorado, cases where immigrants, all they had to do was, in, was announce an intent to become a, a citizen, and then they could vote. And effectively, since the state let them vote, they could vote in federal elections uh, as well. And this was all based on the idea, which was very popular at the time, that your ability to vote didn't depend on your background. It just depended on where you were living at that time, because you were affected by the laws in that place. So those people should be able to vote, even if they were very, very new to the location. And that was the view of a great many Democrats uh, at the time. And so they weren't joking about this sort of thing. And uh, in Colorado, of course, and in New Mexico and any of those other places, this include also a lot of Hispanics. And um, you see that, <laughs> you see that in some uh, commentary at the time where Susan B. Anthony, for example, was complaining about how she had to go and try and convince, quote unquote, Mexican greasers to vote for women's suffrage in southern Colorado. And she found that to be a big hassle. And uh, so th this, these, this vote was not just simply reserved to influential white people. It was quite expansive. The Democrats wanted these new immigrants to be able to vote. But they didn't imagine that this would all necessarily mean that we're all going to become communists now because more people are voting. And so when we look at the historical context, it's clear that in many cases it was the anti-government power party that wanted to expand the vote, both the Jacksonians in many ways, not in every way, and then later with the uh, the Cleveland Democrats, I guess we'll just call them. And so were they just wrong? Or was there something to their idea that we need these votes then to, to counter uh, this centralized power that's in Washington? Throughout American history, you, you have this interesting, and, and you're kind of seeing it with parallels and in, in kind of this, this Trump environment. You saw it with, in parallels of the so the, the Pat Buchanan environment in the 90s, which obviously so fascinated uh, Rothbard, 
is that you know when you have a situation where you have a an understanding that there's some people benefiting at the expense of the rest, you know, the ability for uh, you know you know a, a, a political equivalent of of mobs with pitchforks and, and torches, um, you know, democracy can be a very interesting check against uh, you know centralized control. Um, and you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, if you if you look throughout American history, I mean, I, I, Rothbard I, I think highlighted this in, in some of the uh, during the Progressive Era and some of the lead up to some of the the really expansive control of government is that often it is a uh, there's a very elitist uh, group of people that are the ones most desiring of a centralized government that that has all these powers. Um, to, to remake society, right? It, it's it's not necessarily the the stupidity of the masses that build up these cathedrals of state power. It is a very specialized group of elite that have that, that lack the hubris and had to have these all these very grandiose visions of what they could do if only they were able to have the power, um, and that that they are often the ones that check away some of the restrictions that have been put in place. Um, because I mean, obviously, if, if you look at it for you know going back to like the idea of you know what what is American democracy different you know makes it different in some of these other areas is that you know there are some institutional checks and balances to what the majority can decide, right? Um, you know that is and it's interesting because you do have this 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 battle within a democratic system that you know this came up with Jackson right when when Jackson was elected like he wanted to abolish the electoral college. He thought that because he was the representative of the masses, that therefore he should be the most powerful agent within the federal government. That you know his whims should you know, oversee the the desire, the any uh, interpretation by the courts or by the legislature. That he alone speaks for the people. So there is this interesting dynamic there, where you know if you do have that political support of the masses, um, you know, does that mean that you should have the ability to override these very explicit? design checks on that control um and i, I you know uh and, and again a lot of that those those checks and political norms have kind of eroded over time uh yeah, particularly in the, the 20th century um but you know it's it's again it's not only it's it's not necessarily a, a risk a rush to bribe people or or you know the 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 masses not understanding the consequences of their actions that end up leading to a very powerful state. It is often a very small minority that have a, these, these very grand visions uh, that can give these things. There's a lot more here that, that needs to be reckoned with. Well, I'd like to mention just a couple of books that I think are relevant to this issue, provide some historical context. One is a book called The Virgin Vote uh, by a person named uh, John Grinspan. And I've mentioned this in a couple of articles I've written. And this talks about really the youth vote in mid-19th century America. But it provides a nice, useful picture of how party politics worked uh, at the time. And it, it should be noted that partisan politics in mid-19th century was not a genteel and polite affair. People, it was in many ways like now, people brought up politics in uh, very inop at very in inopportune times. It, we they hadn't all agreed to never talk about politics like they did in mid-century uh, America, and uh, people very much took the position that if I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, we have nothing to talk about, and we probably shouldn't hang out with each other. And this was fairly able to fairly easy to pull off because a lot of these people were divided geographically in many cases, but. There was a lot of hostility between the two groups. Now, given what we know now in terms of the actual power exercised by the federal government, it seems a little bit over the top because in terms of your daily life, it probably really didn't matter that Millard Fillmore was elected president, uh, even if you were on the other side, because what was he going to do and what sort of powers could he actually uh <laughs> <laughs> exercise that might ruin your life, at least from the federal level. It was really the locus of political power was much more at the state and local level. Nevertheless, people got really worked up about that sort of thing, and it's fun to read. Uh, so that's one book, The Virgin Vote. And then another book is called uh, The Transatlantic Persuasion. And this book's out of print. It's from 1967, I believe, by a man named Robert Kelly. And this talks about uh, the Cleveland Democrats, also talks about uh, the Democratic movements under Gladstone, and also how it worked in Canada, 
during this period and looks at the general views behind all of these groups. This is a general liberal program, classical liberal program of expanding the vote for the purpose of limiting government power. And interestingly, in another book that recently came out called American Secession by F.H. Buckley, he talks about that too, how secession can actually be a tool then uh, to increase the power of local majorities who could fight back then against centralized power. And so it wasn't always the case, as a lot of people, especially that whole we're a republic, not a democracy crowd, try and make it look like, oh, it's always been the voting majority that's the real threat to liberty. But a great many uh, Americans throughout history, especially the Jacksonians, Cleveland himself, Jefferson, uh, all those Democrats and Democratic Republicans uh, from the earlier period viewed these small elites as the real problem. And going then into sort of the uh, applications, so we need to ask ourselves, what are good and bad strategies for liberty? I know from experience that I've been, uh, <laughs> that has made me question the idea that handing over everything to the control of some wealthy elites would be a great idea. I uh, was involved in state politics for a long time in Colorado. And Colorado has a thing where you can't get a tax increase unless the voters approve it at the state level. Now you can get a local tax increase if the people in that jurisdiction approve it. And the voters here have a long history of turning down those attempted tax increases. But if you get yourself alone in a room with a bunch of uh, captains of industry and uh, the, the elites of the state, they complain constantly about how these dumb voters won't approve tax increases. And boy, if we could only get rid of that constitutional amendment, which gives the public a vote on tax increases, we could finally fund all the important things we need to fund in this state, more higher ed, more highways, convention centers, all that stuff. And the, the dumb voters keep ruining everything. And boy, we would spend so much more government money if we could just wrench the vote from the hands of these voters again. So witnessing that more than a few times, I think, thank goodness the voters still have some say in this because you hand it over to the Chamber of Commerce and so on, they're going to immediately start advocating for tax increases. So uh, just uh, at least at the state level, my basic experience has not necessarily led me to believe that, boy, uh, the wealthy and the intelligent uh, automatically have this long-term view and they want the private sector to take over. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. In fact, I, a couple of years ago, I was talking with a member of that Chamber of Commerce crowd here locally, and they were talking about what Pensacola was able to do and we are not able to do, and just bemoaning the fact that, oh, well, they have a public library tax of certain amount percent. And just imagine what we could do if we had a public library tax. And I was just like, and just, just cringing in my chair at the very idea of, of, of that. Um, but yeah, like, you know, there's, there's, it's off to the fact that, it, it, and you see that play out all the time in local government and all sorts of things that, you know, like a lot of these same people that, you know, you know, they may wear the the red hat, you know, during most political conversations because that is this is sort of demographic that they're trying to play to. And, and they can afford to do that on kind of disconnected local or national politics. But at local decision making, they, they're absolutely convinced that, you know, you just give them more money then they're going to make the right decisions because it's, you know, they're the ones actually making the decisions. And and things are going to be better off. And it's it's often not that case at all. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is a humility that can kind of be, be that, that democracy can bring over what uh, a, a small group thinks that they can do, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's a, it, there's a check there. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that can be definitely abused, but uh, it, it's not quite as simplistic as a lot of people would like to believe. Well, going back to the are all things equal question, is, okay, so we have a tax increase that's up for vote at the statewide level. Uh, a lot of people clearly believe when they vote against these taxes, which they voted down four tax increases in the last uh, major election year, which I guess was 2016? No, 2018 was the last gubernatorial election here. So at the same time, the voters approved Jared Polis, a Democrat. They voted down four tax increases. So sort of suggesting that just because we vote for a Democrat doesn't mean we, we want tax increases. And so the question is, OK, well, why didn't a majority of those people just vote themselves free money? Well, clearly, a significant portion of those people, rightly or wrongly, viewed themselves as the people who pay the taxes, not the people who receive them. 
And so things aren't all equal. You might have a place where, yep, we can just vote ourselves away to just fleece the rest of the population. But apparently a lot of people seem to think they're the rest of the population, the ones who are getting fleeced, if there's a tax increase. Now, if you run the numbers, that may not be true. There might have been a lot of people voted against the tax increase who might have uh, benefited from it. Uh, directly in terms of free money. And that's actually the argument the left makes a lot of times. Why don't you just vote yourself free money? And uh, a lot of people don't anyway, because they maybe see the implications of that and the problem that they also maybe think in terms of their descendants. And so on. maybe I don't want to saddle my children with a huge tax bill uh, because it's <laughs> it's not like that's some distant future. If you have a 10-year-old now, in 10 years, he's going to be paying those taxes as an adult. And that's why like a Mises Institute audience should understand as well as anyone that you know, value is subjective, right? It's, it's not simply about the dollar amount that a uh, politician's promising you. I mean, there's a lot of people, if you look at this past Democratic primary, for example, you know, the, the candidate that was offering the, the most free goods was Bernie Sanders. Um, but there's a, the majority of the Democrats at the end of the day, uh, I think we're voting for a, a nostalgic idea of a return to the Obama days. And so they voted for Joe Biden, of all people, you know, not the most energetic candidate and you know, not the most uh, uh, you know, charismatic candidate, not the one that's offering the most robust uh, a, a bill of goods. He's just a return to normality. Right. And that's what a lot of the anti-Trump buildup right now is, is a return to that normality. Meanwhile, on the Trump side, I give a lot of people that, you know, they, they might not you know, a lot of them probably are happy with uh, a tax cut, uh, uh, but have big concerns about spending. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the value of voting for Trump is the amount of pain that it will inflict upon a group of people that, you know, that, that have, um, you know, are very, very obnoxious about their political views. And that's that that alone uh, justifies a vote. Um, you know, people make their decision making. It's it's not simply about, you know, how, how do you get the biggest bang for the buck for your vote? It, there's, there's a number of factors there um, because we all have our, you know, different values that, uh, that you, know, in, you know, rightly or wrongly, it, it's, you know, there, there's plenty of you know, research out there. Oh, you know, one vote doesn't matter. But there's a lot of people that just get value on, on casting that one ballot of, uh, for whatever reason they have, um, yeah, that gives them some satisfaction, and that's that works. Well, this brings us then to uh, the issue of what are some of these factors then that prevent people from just voting themselves free money? And uh, the whole Hayekian intellectual trickle-down effect, right? Now, I know a lot of people scoff at this, right? This, oh, people, people don't care about ideas or ideology. And I, I believe it was Hayek who said something to the effect of people who think that ideology doesn't affect people's views are usually in the thrall of the ideology of some dead economist. I'm paraphrasing, but I think it was Hayek who said that. And right, if someone thinks that ideology doesn't matter, it just means they're, they're completely unaware of what ideologies have affected them. But nobody's unaffected by ideology. People believe some sort of worldview. They believe some sort of narrative. And the fact is, when people vote against tax increases, they're believing some sort of narrative which says tax increases hurt your economy in the long run or it's going to come back and, and cost you big time. Where did they get those ideas? Who can say specifically? But chances are good they got it from somebody who was repeating old liberal talking points from the 19th century, back when people used to actually argue that tax increases were bad. Maybe someone in the Democratic Party in the United States back in the 1880s. So that's an important issue. And Hayek was right. Those ideas trickle down. Ideology matters, and that can keep voters from simply just deciding that the democracy is a chance for me to screw over everybody else. Mises seemed to believe the same thing, was if you have a society that's based on liberal ideas, then people aren't going to just immediately pursue a policy of just using the power of the state to destroy everybody else. And those factors matter. They exist. If they didn't exist, then, yeah, we would have descended in just a total democratic free-for-all a long time ago. One of the things that I think that I've noticed when talking with a lot of, of libertarians, things like this, and, and, and this kind of goes to, I think, some of the, um, the criticisms that Jeff Dice has had about political universalism, right? The idea that, oh, that there's a single libertarian political structure that's just right for everyone. It's the idea that there's a specific strategy for liberty that is, is equally equally applicable everywhere. And, and I, I think there's a lot of differences based on the, the, the institutions within a society, you know, what, 
how if are, are the masses more open to skepticism of big government programs or are they more uh, uh, open to that? I think there's a lot of factors um, that that shape how that that those views are um, because there's no there's no shortcut if, if the ideas that are gut that 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 dominate the the uh the, the kind of the intellectual zeitgeist if, if those are bad uh, then you know all the structures in place that you build up you know those can all kind of be eroded if if the public has kind of this this you know it has a suicidal uh, ideology motivating it, I and mean, there's not a lot of ways of stopping. It. And that's that's where you know, Mises you know, talks a lot about you know the, the way that ideas shape society. And so sometimes that that can come down from you know this this Hayekian idea of, of you know, uh, you know a, and, and trickle down uh, the second handlers of ideas. You know, if if you have a good intellectual elite promoting the right ideas downwards, then the the population itself. Can come to these these proper classical liberal ideas. Um, Rothbard, when he in the '90s was writing about you know what's the best strategy for liberty in America as it existed, uh, he had a much more cynical view of the way that these institutions were actually operating in the U.S. He's like, oh, well, you know, obviously the people that are benefiting the most from the state that has been constructed are not going to be giving the most honest uh, analysis of the state as it exists and therefore you have an incentive structure for uh you know beltway think tanks and and colleges relying upon public grant money and uh the, the media that kind of enjoys being in, in the halls of power um uh, you know their incentive is not to inform the public on what the best policy is their incentive is to maintain the sweet gig that they have for themselves and therefore the best way of affecting a change in a more libertarian anti-state direction is to take kind of that more uh, Jacksonian model of calling out the elites as being uh, you know, the, the problem and getting the public to rise up. And again, it, it, there's a lot of... Meanwhile, if, if you talk to a lot of libertarians in South America, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very skeptical of the value of populism because they've seen that same model go in a very negative direction and lead to, you know, Chavez and Venezuela and other other you know, uh, you know, communist strongmen like that. Um, so again, it, the, the, you know, where things are, it, it's it's there's not a simple answer to you know how do we reduce the state. There's a lot that is unique to the, the people and the population and and the the, the institutions within a, a society uh, that can shape how these mechanisms go. Yeah, institutions matter. It should be noted that most Latin American countries have a much more unitary uh, political system uh, for their regimes, a lot less decentralization, uh, much more majoritarian in nature. And this is partly due to the fact that their political institutions come down from Spain rather than uh, Britain. And there's just less of a devotion to really hammering into place the idea that geographically based minority groups should be able to defend themselves from the larger majority. Now, certainly on paper, there is decentralization in Latin America. It's uh, Mexico's official name is the United States of Mexico, and Brazil has states and that sort of thing. But even a lot of those countries like Peru and Chile and so on, uh, Bolivia, have really almost no decentralization at all in terms of uh, formal lawmaking and how their uh, legislatures are comprised. And that that's certainly a factor because there, it's difficult for a minority group that might exist in one part of the country to really cancel out the will of the majority or at least provide roadblocks in its way. And there is, of course, the ideological factor as well in many ways. And almost nowhere did... Uh, liberalism implant itself as thoroughly as it did in the United States and to a lesser extent in Canada and the United Kingdom. But really, the United States is the only truly liberal country uh, left on earth, I think. And even there, even here, it's getting fairly weak right now. But in most of the world, it's much, much weaker, including in other Anglo-Saxon countries. And boy, you could see that right now in Australia with their lockdowns and all of that. And 
So what does that mean? What are the strategies? Well, clearly ideology is an issue, as Hayek and Mises would both say. But decentralization is an important factor as well, as we discussed last time. But let's finish up by talking about Hoppe a little bit then. Because Hoppe, in his essay, uh, What Must Be Done, he talks about strategies for really diminishing the power of the state. And he doesn't say, well, you know, this book is, this essay is one page long, get rid of democracy and everything will be fine. Obviously, he doesn't say that. He, in fact, he just assumes democracy is a uh, well-embedded uh, institution within the political systems he's talking about. And he's mostly talking about the American context. But what he really says is that America should start breaking itself up into small pieces. I recognize that there are some parts in America where the voters, the majority of the voters are actually very much pro-liberty. And those places are going to be well run. They're going to be act as local bastions of really returning the United States, or in some cases, just creating for the first time uh, a regime that truly respects private property. And he wanted a strategy where it was uh, subtle nullification, secession. You just ignore the edicts coming down from the federal government over time. And, and you try to avoid conflict as much as possible. And really describing in many ways what F.H. Buckley talks about in his book, American Secession, as well, and which Ron Paul has talked about in some cases. We're talking about de facto secession, but it doesn't require uh, us installing a monarch. It doesn't require some sort of authoritarian regime. It's just recognizing that the voters in some places are going to be very different from the voters in other places. And those places where the voters take seriously the issue of freedom, those are places where you can start to really uh, put together... Um, the beginnings of a state or a regime or a community or whatever you want to call it that could take private property seriously and maybe hopefully influence its neighbors. Within that, that essay, he talks about you know, the potential for a bottom-up revolution within kind of an American political context, you know, where democracy can be used as a means of protecting property rights against aggressors rather than um, you know, the it, having it being used as kind of the soft variant of communism, um, as, as he you know discusses kind of democracy in theory, and you know, so that's I think that that's why his work is so interesting is that you know even as uh, you know for all of his critiques, I and mean, he recognizes that when we talk about um, you know bringing the world to a more classical liberal uh, property rights grounded society. Um, you know, simply ignoring the parts that are not convenient um, and, and, you know, require, uh, uh, you know, working outside of kind of pure libertarian theory, like simply ignoring them doesn't, doesn't solve any problems. We need to reckon with the world as it exists today and try to figure out ways of, you know, changing the ideology of the masses towards that positive uh, uh, respect for property rights that that is the grounding of civilization um because other, otherwise you know then you know you're, you're taking yourself out of the game entirely and at, at the will of uh, you know whatever the the intellectual elites want society to <laughs> society to go into and that's uh, um that is not always a uh, a hoppy and monarch uh in practice and so uh, again there's he, he, hoppa's work is far more nuanced in this in ways that i think have have real value um to the, the current political environment. Uh, yeah, even a few years ago, he, he was talking about um, the kind of the, the changes that we've seen in the political society and, and addressing them f uh, full on. Um, so again, I, it's, it's very easy to simplify his critiques and, and his ideas, um, but reckoning with them uh, thoroughly, I think provides a lot more value. Well, I think we're about out of time. Uh, next time, I think we can expand a little bit on Rothbard's theory of populism and whether it works or not, because Rothbard certainly departs quite a bit uh, from some of these more anti-democratic thinkers. And Rothbard tends to take the side of the Jacksonians or the Democrats and whoever it is that's uh, doing this uh, pro-democracy, uh, expand the suffrage, fight the power centralized in Washington groups. And we asked that question this time, were they right? Does that actually work? But we didn't really answer the question and so next time, uh, I think we'll, we'll approach that maybe from a more empirical view. Can we, can we come up with examples that show that maybe the populists were right? And is that a real strategy? 
So I hope you'll join us next time. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us on Radio Rothbard. Have a great day. Thank you.